Distinguished participants, dear colleagues, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. It gives us a tremendous pleasure today to welcome you to this public hearing session on the exposure drafts of AUV financial accounting standards on promotional gifts and prizes and financial reporting for Islamic investment institutions, including investment funds. This event is held in collaboration with UAE Banks Federation. We would like to thank them for taking the efforts and extending their support in organizing today's public hearing. The public hearing is one of multiple steps in standard development process at AUFI and represent an opportunity for us to interact with and benefit from the knowledge, experience, and wisdom of professional individuals and experts from all corners of the industry from the newly issued exposure drafts. The exposure draft of a UFI FAS on promotional gifts and prizes prescribe the accounting and financial reporting requirements applicable to promotional gifts and prizes awarded by the Islamic financial institutions to their customers, including quasi-equity and other investment account holders. While the exposure draft of a UFI FAS on financial reporting for Islamic investments institutions, including investment funds, set out the principles of financial reporting for Islamic investment institutions, particularly prescribing overall requirements for the presentation, minimum contents, and recommended structure for their financial statements. Now, and without further ado, let me invite to the virtual floor the Secretary General of AUFI, Mr. Omar Mustafa Ansari, who will present the exposure drafts and walk, walk you through its main content while answering time to time your questions in an interactive session. Brother Omar, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sister Hawra. Auzu billahi min ash-shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Rabbi shahi sadri wa yassir li amri wa halu lughtatan min lisani yafqahu qadi. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and good morning and good afternoon, depending on the places of the world from where you are joining in. It's always a pleasure to be with you, all of, all of you guys. Uh, today, I'm observing a bit uh, lesser attendance and we can well understand that uh, this is happening because of uh, probably multiple factors, including summer vacations, uh, we are having too many public hearings. Last week, there was a public hearing. Tomorrow, there is a public hearing on Sharia side. Last week, it was on the owner's side. And uh, last uh, couple of months, except for some uh, some gap in between around the Eid holidays, uh, most of the time, we have been holding multiple uh, public hearings. So probably, that might be one of the reasons. And also, Islamic investment entities, people might be thinking, might not be applicable to type, all type of institutions. Also, all the certain clauses of Islamic investment institutions apply to all Islamic financial institutions. There are some provisions when we go through it. Uh, promotional gifts and prizes, we already have conducted uh, one public hearing in, uh, in, uh, in English and one in Arabic. So maybe uh, that might also be a reason. But uh, honestly, in last uh, several years, we have been seeing people joining in large numbers, 150 to 200 at times, and not less than 100. So, so today, the number of participants and stations is on our lower side. But uh, I think that uh, we should we should continue our discussion because enough opportunity will still be available to those who are unable to make it today. Because even on investment investment institution standard, we'll be holding multiple public hearings going forward as well. Even on prize, uh, gifts and prizes, there will be at least one English public hearing more going forward. So we hope that the opportunity is still there. Now coming to the topic. The topic of uh, today's discussion, let's start with the promotional gifts and prizes thing. This unique product, and again, gifts and prizes are common in all type of business institutions, uh, particularly those who have a retail business. In the retail business, it is a common practice. And having this common practice at times helps like, uh, how to put it? At times, it helps in 
uh, in in attracting more customers with an incentive beyond the product capability. So the product is good, but there might be equally good products available in the market as well. So you try to apply gifts and prizes on the retail business to add further further sweetness to your product, to give additional incentive. In Islamic financial institutions, there are different types of gifts and prizes. We have uh, uh, considered that some of the gifts and prizes which are available, at, particularly on the asset side, are not that unique as compared to the conventional. So even the generally accepted accounting principles might be uh, equally acceptable. But the problem comes when we have the other side of the uh, of the of the gifts and prizes products, which are on the deposit and investment account side. Here there are a lot of Sharia considerations. So for example, if you are having current accounts the current accounts may not be uh, subject to like uh, any 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 gifts etc that are uh, that may be considered as a replacement for riba this is just one example uh, we we know that some countries have price bond type products so the the general fatwa on price bond products is that this is considered haram although the principles remain secured, but the, the, pro, the main view with regard to the price bonds being impermissible on the Sharia side drives from the principle that that and every loan that gets any benefit and actually the better definition includes any mashrut benefit that is any, uh, any agreed benefit, pre-agreed benefit and in this matter they also say that the, the principle of al-maruf, uh, well, al mashrut also applies, that if something becomes common, it also becomes implied condition. So from that kind of perspective, any current account having gifts and prizes is not acceptable. These are the issues which are already addressed in AOFI's relevant Sharia standards. However, the unique product that we are talking about, which is also covered in AOFI Sharia standards on the gifts and prizes, that is the one that where the investment accounts carry a, a product, uh, a, a element of gifts and prizes. And particularly, again, I would say that gift uh, is not our issue for now. The main issue addressed by this standard is on prices. And that might be one of the questions to the audience today, that uh, to what extent you feel that uh, that uh, we should not be covering any other thing except for only the prizes offered with investment accounts or any other scheme which is based on similar mechanism. Like in UAE, there is Sukukul Watani product. The Google Watani product works exactly the same way. Now, why Islamic financial institutions in the market did it? Uh, like you know, uh, what we can feel that actually in the GCC market before COVID, uh, before interest hikes uh, in the in the COVID time it became a very low uh, return on investments in the conventional and investment Islamic banking deposits. So it was even at times less than 1%, which means that there is no incentive for anybody to keep money in the banks. So the banks started trying to, uh, trying to, uh, to, uh, uh, to convince people to keep their money with the banks by offering uh, prizes. This is started with the conventional banks, but then Islamic banks picked up the same trend. And this we have seen as a common product, particularly in the GCD market. Even after interest rate uh, and the market benchmark rate are going up, it's still this practice is continuing. So from that perspective, addressing this issue for products like uh, uh, prices that are offered by Islamic financial institutions along with their investment accounts, and similarly, products like Sukukul Watni that work on a model similar to price bonds, but uh, are actually based on Mudarba with a with a price element. But from these perspectives, it was decided it was decided by OFI Accounting Board that we need to have a standard, and that is the main area which is not covered by the conventional standards. So the conventional IS thirty seven International Economic Standard thirty seven on. on uh, uh, that it actually covers the price schemes and the and the, yep. I'm sorry and the, 
uh, priority schemes and uh, what we call loyalty schemes particularly. So this is still a question that whether the loyalty schemes and, uh, and other gifts shall we cover in this standard or not. Just one last thing, there is another form of gift which we generally call uh, by its Serbic name that is Hiba, that is included in the profit and loss computation part. That is also not part of the scope of this standard because that is covered in the standard on quasi equity and the standard on off balance sheet investment accounts. So that, that specific type of Hiba that is done as a part of computation rather than offering to general public is not part of the scope of this standard. With that, uh, with your permission, I'd like to share my presentation. Uh, on, again, a lot of people ask about the presentation. Those of you who are uh, attending our public hearings generally, you are aware that the public presentation is just a, a PowerPoint version of the body text of the standard, and the standard is available uh, on the website. Our colleague, uh, Sister Noof, has already put in the chat window the link to the uh, both the standards PDF versions. So normally we do not share this presentation, which is just a PowerPoint version of the main standard. Just a second, I need to, to share my screen, please. I, I believe all of you can see it now. Uh, since public hearing is already conducted on this standard and uh, because of its uh, very uh, limited scope and uh, uh, small size standard, we'll keep a bit less time allocated to this one today. So our target is uh, originally to allocate only 50 minutes, up to 45 to 50 minutes to this standard. So I'll, I'll try to take you through quickly. I have given you the background about the standard. I'll try to take you through the more important parts. Just one thing as I as we need to remind like every time that, uh, that uh, put your, please put your questions in the Q&A tab. Just one thing I'm I'm able to see at the new version of Zoom, that Q&A tab is not appearing in my screen quickly. I have to go to more. I don't know, does it apply to everybody or it is in my, ver my version of Zoom? So just to mention that Q&A tab is available, but you all will have to uh, click on the two Q&A tab if from, your screen, uh, from your bar on your screen. If you don't find it directly, then you will have to go to more and from where you will be able to find the Q&A tab. I think I'll have to keep it open all the time just because of this issue. It will take some of my screen space, but uh, I don't have any other choice because it's not appearing directly. And uh, this has just happened because more recently Zoom updated to the latest version. And after that, some of the icons and some placements have changed. Okay, so till now we don't have any Q any question or comment in the Q and A tab. So our request is that please use Q and A tab to provide your comments and to uh, raise your questions. The objective of this standard is to prescribe the accounting and financial reporting requirements applicable to promotional gifts and prizes awarded by Islamic financial institutions. The institutions to their customers, including cause equity and other investment account holders. Uh, brother, you know, brother Muhammad Yunus Fida has a comment, the data I could not find in the chat section. Brother, brother Yunus, the, in the chat section, uh, there is a link provided to the PDF versions of both standards. It is a chat by Sister Nu Farida. Uh, just try to find it again. I think, uh, yes, it is available in the chat section. 
that for e for both the EDs, there are links provided, short links provided. So just uh, that is available, inshallah. Okay. Sister, uh, sister uh, Noof has already provided this link directly to you as well now as an answer to this. Thank you very much, sister, for the quick action. Uh, there are two links, uh, brother uh, brother Yunus, because these two there are two standards that we are going to discuss today. One is on promotional gifts and prizes, and one is on yeah you you need to download both because we are holding two public hearings in this session today. First on promotional gifts and prizes, and second on Islamic investment institutions accounting. Okay, thank you very much, brother. Okay. So let me let me uh, come back to this uh, this objective again. The objective of the standard is to prescribe the accounting and financial reporting requirements applicable to promotional gifts and prizes awarded by Islamic financial institutions to their customers, including quasi equity and other investment account holders. Uh, just uh, again, I would like to repeat the question that I had because in our earlier public hearing and some other discussions, it came as a discussion point. That if, uh, because our strategy as the OFI board is that we develop uh, accounting standards only in the areas where conventional standards are not available or not uh, like, you know, suitable to Islamic finance. When we say not suitable to Islamic finance means that uh, some of the treatment is not according to the business model of Islamic finance or if it is not in line with Sharia. Some specific requirement of Sharia is not being fulfilled in those matters. So this is our approach towards uh, towards our uh, our standard development. So there was a, although this standard uh, has one approach is that this standard should be comprehensive with regard to the uh, promotional gifts, prizes, loyalty program, all these things which are being offered by Islamic financial institution. The second thing is that other things should be left to generally accepted accounting principles. Even in this one, the treatment is according to that. Uh, but uh, we, uh, the second approach that is recommended by some people is that we make it a further brief standard only on the quasi-equity related, uh, that is investment account related gifts and gift, promotional prizes, not even gifts. So this uh, specific question is raised to you. Uh, sister, uh, sister Haura and Saira, can you create a poll on that? Sister Haura and Sister Saira? Mm. Checking on it. <clears throat> yeah. Can you, can you create a poll on this question? Shall we keep the standard covering all the promotional gifts and prizes related to Islamic finance? Option one or we keep the standard further limited, that is we delete some of the things from the standard and keep it limited to the, in, uh, to the uh, only the uh, promotional, pri uh, promotional prizes which are related to investment accounts. So uh, if you can create the poll, if you don't have direct experience, you have, obviously we, we do it for other public hearings. You can take guidance from Sister Zara, Brother Farhan, etc. If, if, if you can't do it directly, you can take assistance from them. But if possible, try to do this poll now. Okay. 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 So then we move to the scope. The standard shall apply to promotional gifts and prizes, including loyalty programs announced and awarded by institution on behalf of the owners and out of the amounts attributable to the owner's equity to all their specific customers, including quasi equity and other investment account holders. Standard shall not apply to HIBA provided uh, as uh, on, on the par at a part of computation, as this I already mentioned. Promotional prize in the specific context of a standard is a prize used to promote specific products or services or to attract investors by way of holding a draw or by achieving a defined target or a combination of both, which is awarded at a given point of time in future. So prize, we are talking about something that is announced today and given in future. And that is the main subject of this standard. Promotional gift is a gift used to promote specific products or services or to attract investors that is awarded by institution from time to time to certain customers. Loyalty program is usually in form of points accumulated by customer against the purchase or continued utilization of products and services or for maintaining investment accounts, enabling the customers to exchange accumulated points for cash, goods, or 
services on a on a complementary basis or at a discounted rates at a future date. So these are three types of products that we are covering. Prizes, gifts, loyalty programs. They all, uh, why we are distinguishing them? Because prize is announced today and given tom tomorrow in a future day. Gifts are given time to time. And loyalty program is accumulated time to time as a liability as on form of points or other sort of discounts and all that. And that is eventually uh, utilized at a future day. Promotional gifts and prizes are categorized into the following types. Promotional gifts where entitlement occurs instantly at a specific point of time. Promotional prizes that are announced in advance to award it at a future date, mostly contingent on a draw or achievement of a target. And loyalty programs where obligation is accumulated over a period of time. This is exactly what I explained earlier. Institutions shall record an expense with regard to promotional gifts as and when incurred. So when you have promotional gifts, they, they are accounted for as and when incurred. What is the term incurred use? Incurred is understood well in accounting side that even if you did not pay it or did not pass it on, but when you actually incur the relevant expense, when you have, you have uh, become part of that expense and that goes from the framework side that how an expense and what time an expense is recognized. So from that perspective, uh, promotional gifts are as and when incurred. We have not gone into detail of accounting for that. Prizes are the main area where we have defined proper accounting in form of initial recognition, subsequent measurement, etc. So an institution shall record a provision against the obligation against the obligation arising from promotional prizes as and when there is an existing constructive obligation requiring the institution to award the promotional prize, whereby it is more likely than not that the economic resources will flow out of the institution. Now, this is similar to the accounting treatment for provisions than more likely than not. So if you have a situation where your obligation is more probable than not, more likely than not, and you create a constructive obligation, then you then that is the first condition for that. And the institution is able to reliably measure the obligation, including fair value of the in-kind promotional prizes. So if the promotional prizes are in-kind, and you are able to measure the obligation that this is the total obligation, but how much of it will be actually utilized? In most cases, if prizes, most of it will be fully utilized. Uh, in case of loyalty at times, if not fully utilized. But the point is that you need to be able to reliably measure the same, including in-kind prices. An existing constructive obligation referred to in Para 7A normally arises when an announcement is clearly communicated through explicit statements or a consistent history of past actions for the award of the promotional prizes to a specific class or classes of customers, including investment account holders, and resultantly, the institution has created a valid expectation among those parties that it will honor its commitment. So this is the point when you record liability. So it means that you do not record liability when you distribute prizes, but you record liability when you, incur, when you get into that constructive obligation that you have to give up those prizes. So for example, today I announced, and it is mid of the year, and I said by end of the year, whoever maintains uh, like 1 million, 1 million BD as an, an account. I'm just giving you an example, 1 million rupee, for example, in, in their account, they will all be eligible for a, for a draw based on which they will earn a award of maybe uh, 200 million. One of one of them will, total awards will be 200 million out of which first, first prize will be 100, second prize will be 50, then there will be a couple of small prizes, things like this. I will not record the liability today. I will record the liability at the point, uh, I will not record the liability when I pay. I record the liability when I, en when I enter into this obligation on a constructive or explicit basis from which I cannot back out. Uh, sister, uh, sister, the first one will include loyalty programs also. I think the question has to be written more detailed that keep promotional gifts and prizes and loyalty programs in bracket as it is as, as per the as, as it is as per the current scope of the standard 
and the second is to reduce the reduce the scope of the standard and to to keep only promotional prices related accounting only so the first one also has the loyalty program so you need to mention that as well and uh, just kindly revise the question again before you complete the poll thank you very much okay The amount against provision of promotional prizes recognized shall be charged as an expense except when requirement of paragraph 12 apply. So the second important aspect of this accounting is that today if I do it, I will, I will recognize it. But are there any conditions when I can amortize it over a period of time? Because the benefit that I'm getting in form of marketing of my, my things might be over a period of time. So for that is where Paragraph 12, we'll go to that. First, let's discuss the normal accounting and subsequent measurement. The carrying amount of the provision shall be reviewed at the end of each financial reporting period and necessary adjustment shall be made. Any changes in the amount of provision shall be accounted for as a change in accounting estimate and recognized as an expense or reversal during the period except where the requirements of paragraph 12 apply. Paragraph 12 is the one where we allowed in limited situations uh, 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 sort of capitalizing that expense for some point of time and amortizing it over a period of time. Then we have this loyalty program provision. Initial recognition and institutions record a provision against obligation for loyalty programs based on the points accumulated to the customer in line with the requirements of relevant occupancies, also considering the following very significant. A, probability of expected utilization of loyalty programs, timing of utilization of loyalty points, and, and, uh, and the amount against provision for loyalty points recognized shall be charged as an expense. Uh, I think uh, Sister uh, sister uh, sister Hora, please make a note of it. This item number 9C should have been a separate paragraph. I think we noted it in the earlier public hearing as well. Okay? Okay. 9C should be a separate para. 9A and B should be one para, and 9C should be separate para. Just Remind me, this we just noted in the earlier public hearing as well. Better to keep it as a separate para. Now, loyalty program subsequent measurement. The carrying amount of the provision shall be reviewed at the end of each financial reporting period and necessary adjustment shall be made. Any changes in the amount of provision shall be accounted for as a change in accounting estimate and recognized as an expense for the period. This is in line with IFRS and generally accepted accounting principles. Now, there are coming some important issues. Uh, we are saying that even if you have this expense, how to charge it off as expense? So the question is, if this is related to investment account, does it is it is it cost of fund or is it marketing expense? In the conventional term, some institutions may consider it as cost of fund. They say that our perspective, we reduce the distributable interest directly and we incorporated this one to make it more incentivized. But according to Islamic finance, you cannot do it. Sharia does not allow it. So from Sharia perspective, the gift has to be out of the pocket of the owner only. And it cannot be, and again, in Islamic finance, we don't have a cost of fund, which means that the investment account returns are based on the underlying asset returns. So the profit and loss computation that is done should, should not be and does not include this computation for promotional, promotional prizes, which means that it is proposed or rather it is uh, like you know it is proposed by the in the in the standard and concluded by the board that these expenses are marketing and promotional expenses and these are not cost of fund so how to place them and present them in the income statement would be different here okay i can see there is a q and a question in the q and a tab brother muhammad usman siddiqui assalam alaikum and welcome brother the expense charge should be indirect expense borne by the institution or charged to respective investment pool if promotional prize is awarded to pool holder. Brother Usman, I was like, thank you very much. It was a very good question. And actually, right now, I was trying to answer exactly the same question. So our view as the board is that this cannot be, as per Sharia, part of the profit and loss computation. And it is not cost of fund because in Islamic finance, there is no cost of fund. Investment account returns are based on the returns attributable to the underlying assets. So from that perspective, 
we have concluded and proposed in this standard that it should be considered as a marketing and promotional expense, which means that it is not on the top line, but again, under FAS1, it's not the top line thing, it's separate. But the point is, it's an owner expense. Now, I believe the question is available to all of you. I can see now, Alhamdulillah, 83 parchments are there. So may I request all of you to kindly uh, please uh, answer the question in the poll, which is with regard to the scope of this standard. That may, The question is that shall we consider this standard covering a, like, you know, as a comprehensive standard covering all the promotional gifts, prizes, and loyalty programs that are there in Islamic finance, one. Or as a recommendation that we received from some people earlier, that since the accounting for loyalty programs, accounting for gifts is in line with IFRS and other generally accepted accounting principles and is not unique to Islamic finance, we should not be developing a standard covering those areas but we should keep the standard limited to the main focused area that is the loyal, that is the promotional prizes offered by islamic financial institutions which include like you know products like sukukul watni if offered by other countries as well which means that the product is primarily a mudarba or another uh, like you know participatory investment account and there is a element of promotional prizes on that which is announced today paid in future. We still believe that this is the main scope of the standard, but the point is to keep it comprehensive or to keep it very brief. That is the main question that we are asking you as a poll. I can see a couple of comments on the, on the, I can see a couple of comments on the, uh, on the, uh, on the chat window. So may I request all of you to put it in the Q&A tab. Again, I mentioned in the, more, in the beginning of the session that uh, after changes in, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, front-end uh, uh, interface of uh, Zoom, uh, the Q&A tab has gone into the more, uh, more, more options. So it is not appearing directly on the, on the bar that you see on Zoom screen, but rather it's going on the more. So, but Q&A tab is available. Similarly, the polls are also available at the, at the same place. After clicking on more, you will find the polls. So all of you are requested to uh, provide answers to the polls. I'm not allowed to vote on that. So what uh, we'll, we'll wait for like a sub, sub, few, few minutes so that everybody can answer on that. Okay, so... What we are saying, paragraph 6, 10, 11, 12, and 13, whatever is appearing, those expenses are promotional marketing explanation. The promotional marketing expense shall generally be charged to the owner's equity of the institution unless the promotional gift, promotional prizes, and loyalty programs relate to the asset side or service-based products and the source of funding and attribution of respective revenue of such products in an investment pool, in which case it shall be considered as an expense of the investment pool. So let's have an example that we have promotional price or promotional gift on the asset side. Which means that, for example, I have a program where on all, all car leases under Ijara Muntaya Bittam League, we provide that every fifth or every tenth will be given a discount or on a random basis, some of them will be given a discount on registration or they will be given a free, uh, uh, a free takaful or they will be given a uh, for example, some free, like, you know, accessories in the car. This is just an example I'm giving. Now, this Ijara Muntahiya Bittam League is part of the investment pool, and the investment pool returns are part of, are, are, are the basis for determination of return to the investment account holders. So in these situations, in these situations, it might be appropriate to have those expenses charged in the pool, even if they are promotional and marketing expenses, but these may still be charged in the pool. On the other hand, the investment accounts related, pro uh, 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 related prizes are an incentive to keep the investment account with the bank. 
which means that the bank will be earning as a mudarib. And those are the situations where we believe that it should not be and should never be part of the profit computation and it should be given out of the owner's equity in line with the requirements of your official year standard. This explanation is one of the places where you might feel before answering your poll question to the poll, you might still feel that there might still be some unique elements to the gifts and prizes and loyalty programs, which are, I although generally covered under IFRS, but this type of explanation and a few things might still be needed. And that was probably the reason that we kept, kept it as a comprehensive standard. But so before answering your poll, you can, if you have not answered it yet, please try to answer it. But before answering your poll, poll, you can consider that some minor elements like this might still require the gifts and loyalty programs, et cetera, to be kept because this explanation might still be necessary even if the main accounting of that is being done under, IFR, under IFRS or other generally accepted accounting principles. Now, this para 12 is also important, as I mentioned, that generally the expenses in respect of promotional prizes shall be immediately recognized. However, there may be certain material prizes that can justify recognition of a corresponding asset to, the, to be amortized over a period of time to the extent that awarding of such promotional prize is not vested subject to the following conditions. The promotional prize is a part of marketing and promotional promotion campaign spanning over a period of at least 12 months, whereby the promotional prize or prizes is awarded at the end of or over the span of such period. The total obligation in respect of promotional prizes is considered material and a positive correlation is demonstrated between increased business and hence increased revenue against such asset to justify the matching concept through appropriate projections and financial models, provided that suitability of such projection models shall be reassessed at each financial reporting date. So what we are saying is, now this is where we are slightly different from IFRS. Uh, conceptually, we believe that we are not against IFRS, but IFRS generally believes that all the marketing and uh, marketing expenses should be generally charged off. We are, we are saying that it's a marketing expense which is incurred and attributed over a period of time. So there might be some room for that. So this is the second area where we particularly would like to request you to provide your kind comments that this is also another important area where you, whether you feel that what we have written here by providing a flexibility to Islamic financial institutions, which is, we don't believe which is conceptually against IFRS, but which is against the general requirement of IFRS, where IFRS normally does not allow the capitalization of marketing campaigns. Here we are saying that it's a marketing campaign, but again, the justification that we have is that the whole expense of the marketing campaign is not incurred today. Rather, it's a marketing campaign spanning over a period of time and the other factors, including the vesting part, that the prize is not vested, which means that prize will become due on a future date. So if the price becomes due today, then you cannot defer the expense or capitalize the expense. But in case price is not vested today, we can have a mechanism in which if we can justify that it is attributed to the increased business and all that, in that situation, this can be deferred over a period of time. Again, this is one of the very complicated accounting issues. And since it is slightly different from IFRS, we would like to particularly have comments from the participants today on this point. I'm, I'm not sure uh, today uh, a bit, people are a bit quiet. We are not having enough comments. Too many comments are not there. So, because uh, this is like, you know, I, uh, this is again, I, we, we can well understand that this practice is not there in all the markets. In some markets, regulator does not allow these type of promotional gifts and prizes because it, uh, and if you ask me, Islamic finance should not be having it because it is playing with the people's speculative mind. It is pe playing with the people's greed and the, and the gambling element comes in. Even we, I'm not saying it's haram, but the gambling element and the gambling mindset and the speculative mindset is appreciated by these products. So for me, if you ask me, I will say that this product is against the maqasid sharia it is against the essence of Sharia. But is it haram? No, it is not haram. It is offered for competing with the conventional market players. It is offered for addressing some of the marketing needs of the institutions. So we don't say that it is haram, Or, but if you ask me, 
I prefer that these sort of products should not be offered by Islamic financial institution. So then you will ask why you are doing the standard because this is a market practice. And if it is not haram, we have a Sharia standard on that, uh, which allows it subject to certain conditions. And based on that, we believe that it is important that the accounting part of it should be available within the OFI standards, including certain Sharia aspects on the accounting part. So if we don't uh, clarify those Sharia aspects on the accounting part, it might be possible that some institutions charge it in the investment pool, which is not appropriate. Some institutions may take it out of the investment accounts to in investment account holders part of profit, which is not allowed by Sharia. So at least this standard serves a purpose of ensuring the minimum level of Sharia compliance if such products are offered. But these products, in my humble view, are not part of the unique uh, unique system of Islamic finance and rather it's a, it's a market factor based thing not based on the original concepts of Islamic finance. This is my personal view. Uh, again, I would repeat, if it is allowed by Sharia subject to conditions, we don't say that it is impermissible. We simply say that the gambling mindset and the speculative mindset created by this type of product is not in line with the original concepts of Islamic economics and finance. I can see, Alhamdulillah, now there are 98 parchments. When we started, actually, we were a bit, uh, we were a bit worried. I was personally a bit worried because uh, uh, normally the registrations we are having in higher numbers. I think we are holding too many public hearings, as I mentioned, that last week there was for governance. And now, today, we are having these two public hearings on accounting. And tomorrow, there is a public hearing on Sharia standard on Sukuk. So there are a lot of activities going on at our end. So maybe we are taking too much of your time. So thank you again for being with us. Uh, just quickly, let me take you through the presentation and disclosure part before we move to the next standard. So in the in addition to the presentation disclosure requirements of PAS 1, what we need to disclose is the accounting policies related to these products, the provision and movement of provision related to these, including the corresponding expenses, et cetera, and non-vested provisions which are not yet expensed out in case uh, if there is a deferment. Effective date of the standard is supposed is proposed to be 1 January 2026. Uh, we hope that this standard will be finalized within next quarter, inshallah. We are complete, we have to complete one more public hearing after which this will be finalized, inshallah. So with that, uh, uh, with that, at this point of time, I think uh, we have to close the discussion on this standard. Let's take uh, comments in the Q&A tab. There is a comment from our very respected brother, Sadaqat Sahab from UAE. In many IFIs in UAE are during deposited by offering prices in million. The, Brother Sadaka, that is the reason that we are developing it because some of the markets in, 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 the, in GCC in particular are offering it. Uh, Bahrain is offering it. I think uh, Saudi also have some products like this. UAE has products like this. I think Qatar has products like this. I think Oman did not allow it. Oman Central Bank did not allow it, but uh, otherwise some of the Islamic financial institutions in these countries are having it, particularly UAE and Bahrain. So from that perspective, we believe that this is uh, press, uh, that development of this standard is necessary. So let me just open the floor for quick discussion. If anybody has a comment, uh, you can raise your hand as well uh, if you want to speak up. Anybody want to speak up before we move to the next second standard for today? Now we can have two hands raised. So uh, there is uh, from 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 Mukhavi Smile and Miftahu Dibaba. So sisters, can you kindly allow them to speak, please? And Uberbat also, if you can just allow them to speak, please. One by one. So if we go with Mukhavi yep. Smile, okay. First Mukhavi Smile, please. Okay, uh, Uber, but please, please go ahead. Yes, uh, the respected uh, Ansari Saab, Salaam Alaikum, thank you very much. Uh, I just um, had this question that, uh, so promotional uh, activities that we are doing for Islamic, uh, can it be part of the contra revenue? Can we make it contra revenue? If you are giving discounts? No, 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 that was my, that was, my, that was the main point. That we cannot make it contra revenue 
on the investment account side. So if your promotional prizes are related to investment accounts, investment accounts, then you cannot make it contra revenue because the contra revenue there is the distribution of attributable profits coming from the underlying assets, which means that this will not be uh, conventionally what we call cost of funding. So it is not cost of funding, rather it is an incentive paid by the owners out of their pocket. So that is the reason that, uh, that is one of the main reasons that uh, we wanted to develop this standard, that we wanted to have standardized presentation in the financial statements. So the answer is that it's not a contra revenue or it's not attribution of uh, profits, but rather it's a promotional and marketing expense to be borne by the investment account holders. Only exception that I mentioned was that if the promotional prizes or the promotional gifts are related or loyalty programs are related to the underlying assets, which are part of the investment account. So it is related to uh, IJARA, it is related to credit cards, it is related to, so the activity is part of the investment pool and its income is going to the investment pool. In that situation, this expense can be taken to the investment pool before attributing the profits and losses. But, uh, uh, yeah, please. Yeah, please well, Larissa, um, if it's a cashback offer, offering cashback on credit card purchases or, yeah. new, uh, or new accounts effectively, you know, so that yeah. uh, basically re reduces the net revenue from these products. So, so, yeah. so can, can that be considered as... Uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, on the investment pool, in the investment pool. But the point is that in, at times, you know, most of the time, credit card revenue is the service revenue. It's not always in the investment pool, but again, it depends. So if it is, if the invest, if the credit card portfolio is part of the investment pool and it's related revenue is going to the investment pool, then related loyalty programs, gifts, prizes, which are related to those credit cards that can be taken to the investment pool, which means that it is part of, it reduces the revenue, but it needs to be disclosed, but it reduces the revenue on that part. But on the investment account side, because it's a Mudarba contract or a, a similar participatory contract, in that one, you cannot say that, uh, like, like if I do it out of as a bank, it means that I'm giving out of my, my profit for uh, on a on a tabarro basis. Uh, uh, you, you, if you understand the concept of takaful, the takaful is permissible and insurance is not permissible because takaful is a, uh, Takaful also has gharar, but since it is not an exchange contract, so the gharar in Takaful is acceptable. Same analogy applies here that if I am distributing gift on a tabarro basis, on a non-exchange, non-commutative contract basis, I can have gharar in that. So I can say, okay, out of five people, I'll give it to one person. But on the other hand, on the other hand, if I... Uh, if I, if I, uh, like, you know, uh, uh, if I take it the other way around and I say that, uh, how to put it, that, uh, that this is a profit of the investment account holders, which will be distributed between the investment account holders based on a, based on a, uh, like, you know, uh, draw for prices or based on random or inequally, not according to profit. That is not as per Sharia. The Sharia says that the profit distribution to the Rabul Mal should be done according to a proper mechanism. You cannot, you cannot say that out of your profit, we took up 10% of that profit and we give it to one of you. That is a that is an exchange contract, commutative contract, and a gharar in that contract will make the transaction invalid from Sharia perspective. So that uh, is the issue. That is the issue that we cannot, and that was one of the reasons that we wanted to develop this standard to clarify this thing very clearly, that if you are doing prizes or investment accounts, you cannot make it part of the profit and loss computation, but you need to say that as owner, I am giving it to you. Okay. Okay. So, so Ansari sahab, just, uh, just to like sum it up. So sure, offering sure, sure, please. Any, yeah. So offering any cash bonuses or incentive for opening or, uh, an investment account, it cannot be recorded as a contra revenue. Similarly, yes. for any promotional, Agreed. Uh, Agreed. promotional, yeah, uh, uh, like similarly providing any higher profit rates on investments account for a, a promotional period cannot be uh, from the contra revenue. 
Yes, because done. Done. The, 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 in the profit and loss computation and computation, you need to do it according to a proper mechanism. You cannot say that, I, but that is out of owner's part. When it is out of owner's part, it should be done in a different way. Now, there is one thing uh, just to mention. We have a scope exclusion. The scope exclusion says that a profit and loss computation type HIBA is not included in the scope of this one. So if your Sharia board and your Sharia standard allow a higher weightage to some investment accounts, so if I if you announce in advance that the weightage of the investment account holders for the first year will be slightly higher according to this. And if it is approved by your Sharia board, I'm not saying that we are allowing it as a UFI, but if it is approved by your Sharia board and it is contractually agreed between the parties that the investment account holders for the first year will be having slightly higher weightage. Okay? If it yeah. is pre-agreed and announced and agreed by all parties involved, means that you announced it as part of weightages and all that, that higher weightage can be part of the contra revenue because that is already a part of the overall mechanism for profit and loss distribution, which is a pre-agreed. Again, I'm not saying that it's a preferred thing by Sharia, but if you agree it in advance that these are the weightages assigned and everybody agrees to those weightages and continues in the pool, it means that this is this can become this. If there is a HIBA out of the out, as a part of computation, so there are some specific HIBA, there are some generalized HIBA, reduction in mudarib share in case of some classes of assets or classes of investment account holders, that is also part of the computation of profit and loss. That can be part of the what we call invest uh, contra revenue, what you are calling, or we call it attribution of profit to investment account holders. But if there is an announcement of a prize or gift like this, and that is primarily to have more customers there, and that is not part of the pre-agreed computation and the computation mechanism that is already approved by the Sharia board, then that has to go to the investment accounts. Uh, so uh, that has to go to the, sorry, uh, marketing expenses. My apologies. Understood, understood. That was very, very helpful. And thank you very much, Ansari, sir. Thank you. A real pleasure. And that's highly appreciated. Uh, it was a good question. And I hope I was able to respond to that. Brother Mahavi, uh, brother Debaba also mentioned, I think that his question was also uh, similar to this question. So I think he will not be raising the question again. Will Let me request Brother uh, Mahavi, smile if, if you have a question because your hand was raised and you were allowed to speak. Okay, in the meanwhile, Sister Haura, can we have the poll results screen on the screen? Can you just uh, show the poll results on the screen, please? Okay, so the 67% of the participants who responded, not every participant responded, we got response from 51 participants, out of which 67%, that is two-thirds, said retain all type of commercial gifts and prizes in this one. And 33% said that limit the scope to encompass only promotional prices. So I think that majority is in favor of covering all of these. So from that perspective, we'll take this answer. Uh, sister, this answer need to be taken to the working group and to the board because this issue was raised uh, with regard to the scope of the standard. So with that, uh, we conclude the first public hearing uh, session for today. And uh, we, we have to move to the second public hearing session for today now. Uh, I don't know, I don't recall, sister, was, uh, did we keep a break between the two or we just need to start? Uh, no, sister, there is no break. No, brother, okay. sorry. Okay. Uh, there is no okay. Break. okay. I think it's only one hour that we started, actually 55 minutes because we started five minutes late. So let's uh, move to the second standard also now. And uh, then we can... Uh, just a second, let me, allow me to share my screen, please. So you... Just a second. Okay, I think now it's the correct file. There were two files open, so I think I was mixing up. Okay, so now you can see my screen. Okay, 
Now, uh, before going to this one, let me give you a bit of background. Uh, we, as of now, we have our FAS 17, Financial Accounting 17, on investment funds. FAS 17 was, oh, sorry, FAS 14, my apologies. FAS 14 was developed around 20 years back. So, uh, I think if you allow me to check the exact date of its uh, issuance, it was, I think, uh, It was developed, I think, in, it was issued in 2000. Now we are talking about 24 years. So a standard that was developed 20 years back, 24 years back from now, might be a very good standard at its time, but for sure with the evol uh, evolution of the uh, Islamic finance industry and the evolution of the, uh, of the, uh, of the accounting practices, Evolution of AOFI's own standards, having the new framework, having the new financial accounting standard one and all that. There was a need to revise the existing FAS 14, which is on investment funds. We believe that investment funds and other type of investment and institutions are a very important and significant part of Islamic finance industry. Uh, we had picked up this project around five years, four, five years back that it needs revision and improvement in line with the new FAS1, in line with the new framework, and with some of the ex expanded scope, which was not covered in the earlier standard. So from that perspective, uh, this project took a bit time, a bit, uh, we, we initially, we, we, we were a bit slow on this one because of a lot of priorities that were, we were having on the accounting uh, for, uh, for, uh, for banks, the CAFOL and others. Uh, so it uh, got a bit slowed down, but Alhamdulillah, now we have come up with a very nice, uh, we, we believe a very nice exposure draft of a standard, thanks to the team that has worked on that uh, very hard. So this standard is going to replace FAST 14. It is going to expand the scope from investment funds to investment entities. It is going to address some issues specific to investment entities, including issue of consolidation of investment entities as well. It aligns the requirements of the accounting with FAS1. So this standard needs to be read with FAS1 because FAS1, uh, FAS1 part A1, first part of FAS1 covers all Islamic financial institutions. It's part two covers banks, but FAS1 overall, Covers all Islamic financial institutions. So the definition of an asset, uh, the 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 minimum contents of the financial statements, these things are actually already covered in the framework and the FAS one. So we had to align them together in a way that all Islamic financial institutions come closer. In addition to that, we need to understand that the way financial statements of uh, uh, of mutual funds and investment funds were being developed are being are being prepared and developed in line with IFRS, our standard was becoming significantly different from them. That was one of the reasons that we were supposed to align as maximum as possible with the generally accepted accounting principles and IFRS as well in line with our newer strategy. So this has been a very comprehensive project to date and very interesting project. I, we believe that it's a very interesting and very uh, comprehensive, very nicely done standard. But again, for that, we need to listen from you. It's a, it's a self-praise thing that we are praising our own product, but we believe that and we hope that industry will find it quite useful, inshallah. So uh, this is just a background. So let me first take you through the significant changes. The scope of the standard has been expanded to include different type of triple I's. Triple I's that is Islamic investment for institutions in addition to Islamic investment funds. So earlier the scope was investment funds, but now we are saying that it includes Islamic investment institutions, including the funds. So the main target market is fund, but if you have a Islamic, uh, Islamic sovereign wealth fund, if you have a Islamic uh, uh, Sharia compliant uh, venture capital company and venture capital funds established by that company or private equity firm or a, or a Islam, Sharia compliant, Sharia compliant uh, family, family fund. 
there can be lot of situations where you can have investment institutions beyond investment funds. We had this question in front of us, and let me request our team to put a poll to that as well, that do you feel that all the investment institutions shall be covered in one standard, or you feel that, so that is the question number one. So do you agree with the current scope of this standard, which include all type of Islamic investment institutions in one standard? Or question number two, option number two is, do you believe that investment funds should be covered like mutual funds and all these should be covered in one type of institute, one standard and other funds, including venture capital, REIT, sovereign wealth fund, family funds, uh, and other investment institutions, companies that are formed cost primarily for the purpose of having investments and they have investment motive, not the running the business or business general operations motive. What should be the approach towards that? So do we keep one standard or we develop two standards? So Sister Haura and Saira, if you can just put a poll on this part as well, it will be quite helpful. The financial reporting principles have been aligned with the requirement of phase one. So this is standard is to be read with phase one. So part one of phase one will be fully applicable on this one. So this is to be read in addition to part one of phase one. So a lot of things which are there in phase one are not repeated. I'll, 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 I'll emphasize on that, that lot of definitions and lot of things which are there have not been repeated. So, so we have aligned with the new framework. We have aligned with the new phase one. We have decided that whatever there in part one of phase one, not necessarily to be repeated. Some unique things are repeated, which are specifically applicable here, but general requirements have not been repeated. In addition, the particular changes include definitions and terminologies have been modified, cross-referred and improved. Certain presentation requirements, for example, the statement of portfolio investments, receivables and financing have been aligned with the approach followed in newer AOF phases, and hence this information is expected to be included in notes to the financial statement, which implies that a separate statement is no more required. So phase 14 is requiring a statement of investment portfolio and financing. We are saying that that statement now goes into notes. The concept of cash equivalent value and uh, for recognition and measurement purpose has been removed. Earlier standard was using the term cash equivalent value. Now we are using the terms normally the fair value and other like, you know, the terms which are aligned with IFRS and with the newer AOF phases and frameworks. So the term cash equivalent value, which was creating a anomaly has been removed. So we have kept the things on fair value, amortized cost, according to whatever is the appropriate model. The concept and the financial reporting principles for causa equity have been introduced, whereby considering the type of the IIIs as well as the contractual arrangement with the investors, it has been clarified that investment may take form of either equity or causa equity. This is a fundamental difference because if you if you see, according to IFRS and generally accepted accounting principles, any instrument that has a put option is a liability. So according to IFRS, most of the mutual funds open-ended open-ended mutual fund where you can go and ask your money back anytime, they are technically having a liability and no equity. Most of them have no equity and only liability. According to AOFI's concept, since the underlying assets are there and since we have the concept of causa equity, so we said that we have not gone to the liability part uh, like uh, because even under our investment accounts are considered causa equity as per AOFI, while as per IFRS at times they are considered as liability. So from that perspective, we have not taken the liability route. We have taken the equity or quasi-equity route. So we are saying that if, if your units have a put option that people can come and take money out, it is a quasi-equity. If that option is not there, it's equity. So we have aligned the requirements with the newer framework and the core concept and the core uh, principles of Islamic finance. The financial reporting principles in respect of triple I is comprised of more than one virtual entity or sub funds have been prescribed. So because it is possible that you can have multiple sub funds or you can have multiple pools. So that concept in line with the banking concept has also been brought in. The concept and accounting requirements in respect of net asset value differential are introduced to address the frequent entries, entries to and exits from the open-ended IIIs by the investors. Earlier standard was not addressing the concept of this element of uh, gain or loss in the exits and 
uh, and entry. So we have brought in the concept of the net asset value differential. Again, there are different terms used in different markets, but the concept is there that in most of the open-ended funds, uh, when you enter the fund, there is a front-end load, and then you exit, there is a front-end, uh, the back-end uh, back uh, discount. So these are the things that actually uh, actually apply on the real type transactions, which was not addressed by the earlier standard. We have tried to address that part. We have distinguished, we'll go to the definition, but we have distinguished the load from the fee. Load we are saying will apply, load or discount will apply when the benefit goes to the participants and the fee when the uh, front end or back end fee, when the benefit of the fee goes to the, uh, to the manager of the fund. The predecessor standard included certain governance requirements and additionally certain requirements related to reporting to stakeholders, which are typically not part of accounting and financial reporting requirements. Such requirements have not been included in the revised standards. This is also important that having a Sharia board report or having a, having some of the reporting requirements as part of the governance requirements or part of the accounting standard. We, we can well understand that at that point of time, if we do not have governance standards, uh, particularly in the size and numbers that we have right now, so at that point of time, the board at, uh, considered, and it was a single combined board for EOFI's accounting, governance, and auditing standards. So the board considered keeping some of the requirements related to governance in the standard. It was common uh, at that point of time that even a lot of uh, Sharia requirements were also part of the accounting standards at that point of time. Now with the revision of all these standards and improvement of all these standards, what we are doing is that we are aligning the standards in a way that uh, that the accounting standards should not be containing the governance or Sharia requirements. So from that perspective, we have removed the governance related requirements from FAST 14. Now the question is on screen for me, I can see, should all investment institutions be included within the scope of single standard or should we develop two separate standards with one specifically at focusing on investment institutions with investment motives? That is one on the one on the i think uh, sisters again the question should have been clarified with one on the investment funds and one on the investment institutions other than investment funds i think you need to put the question again uh, the, the the question is uh, the second part of the question is not very clear so the two two possible standards are one on investment funds and one on investment institutions other than investment funds okay so this, this is the question. So maybe if you can kindly slightly improve the question, that will be helpful for all the participants. Then this standard clarifies that an I, due to its unique business model and intention of investment is and shall always be considered exempt from the following the equity accounting method or from consolidating investment entity into its financial investee and company into its financial statements. Investee entities, uh, sister, uh, sister Saira, please make a note of it. And F, we should change it to invest in, investee entity, not company. Okay? Noted. So these are the principal changes. Uh, do we have any questions? No, not yet. So till now we don't have any questions. So let me take you through the question uh, to the objectives now. The objective of this standard is to set out the principles of financial reporting for Islamic investment institutions, particularly prescribing overall requirements for the presentation, minimum contents, and recommended structure for their financial statements in manner that facilitates truthful and fairful presentation, to truthful and fair presentation in line with the Sharia principles and rules. The scope says that this standard shall apply to all Islamic investment institutions. The standard shall also apply to employee retirement benefit funds managed by Islamic financial institutions for the benefit of their own employees, in addition to the requirements of generally accepted accounting principles. This is uh, like, uh, uh, just keep in mind that IS 26 applies on the, investment, on the employee benefit funds. So we are saying that even if you are Islamic bank, and you have your own investment fund, uh, investment fund for your own employees, like a pension fund or a gratuity fund or a provident fund, we are saying that those funds should be following IS 26 in addition to requirement of this standard, but not ignoring the requirements of this standard. Particularly the required disclosure requirements in respect of nature of underlying assets and their respective compliance with Sharia principles and rules shall be applicable. We have no intention at this point of time to develop a standard for employee benefit funds because the main accounting in the IS 26 we have believe is okay. But the problem is that IS 26 has no specific consideration to Sharia compliance of the underlying assets. 
And that is why we are emphasizing here that if you are in Islamic financial institutions, you, your managed uh, employee benefit fund should also be in line with Sharia. So from that perspective, it, that, uh, you should be applying IS 26 and this is standard together, particularly the disclosure requirements with regard to the underlying assets should be according to this one. There is a comment in the chat window. Uh, can I request every time? Okay, brother, uh, brother Miftahu Dibaba has a question, but brother, again, if you have a question, please put in the query tab. Okay, we can allow you now to speak. So if you can put your question quickly. So please allow Brother Miftahu Dibaba for to speak up for now. Go ahead, brother. You want to speak up or you want to put question in the Q&A tab, please? Okay, I think we should move on uh, because uh, the, uh, probably he put this comment in the chat window, but he did not uh, is not speaking up. So let's uh, give him an opportunity to write in the Q and A tab and move ahead. This standard shall not be applicable on off balance sheet assets under management that do not take form of a separate legal entity. So now you will ask me a question: What this is, uh, exclusion exclusion is about, and what to do with restricted investment accounts? So we are saying. If you are a bank and you are having a restricted investment account and you are not giving the restricted investment account a legal entity status, then that will be covered under the standard on off balance sheet assets under management. If you create that restricted investment account with ring financing and you created a separate legal entity for that in form of a trust or a company or whatever, in that situation, that fund will not be considered an off-balance sheet asset under management. Rather, it will be considered an investment institution under this one. So if you give it a legal entity, it comes into scope of this standard. If it does not, it is not in the... So that is the, why we brought in the concept of sub-funds also. So there can be an investment institution that may have multiple funds, but each fund is not given proper ring fencing and not a legal status. In that situation, those sub-funds will be considered separate sub-funds within the institution rather than being considered as separate investment institutions. So the main condition is legal entity, which can be a corporate entity or a trust or any other similar mechanism. So if you create a separate legal entity by ring fencing, apply this standard. If you don't do it, apply off balance sheet asset under management standard or within this standard, apply the sub-fund approach. Now the question is on, on the screen, so may I request all of you to answer this question number four as a poll, that whether shall we keep all the investment institutions in one standard or shall we divide it into two standards in which one will be on investment funds uh, and the second one will be for investment institutions other than investment funds. So may I request all of you to answer this question. This is important for us to understand and to take it to the board. If you, uh, if you feel uh, that there are a lot of similarities in between the two and there is no need to duplicate, then suggest the option that we should keep one. And if you feel that by nature investment funds are different from other investment institutions, then please let us know that uh, you prefer to have two different standards. Investment institutions taking the form of a work from Sharia perspective, which are subject to financial reporting requirements as prescribed in respective OPFAS, that is FAS 37. And investment funds, for example, participant investment funds managed by Takaful institutions, which are subject to financial reporting requirements as prescribed in relevant OPFAS, that is FAS 42 and 43. So these are the exclusions. So if you have restricted investment accounts without legal entity, apply off balance sheet asset under management standard. If you have a fund taking form of a WAF, take it, give it the apply fast for, for fast 37. If you have a uh, in, uh, if you have a uh, fund which is uh, uh, which is a takaful takaful managed fund like participant investment fund, although it has all similarities, but that has to be accounted for under fast 42 and 43. This standard shall be read in conjunction with requirement of part one of uh, phase one whereby the provision of the standard shall be considered along with the requirements prescribed therein about the general presentation and disclosure in the financial statements of all IFIs. However, the specific provisions of this standard shall apply in case of a conflict between the requirements of the two standards. 
This standard shall apply only to the standalone financial statement of uh, IIII, and IIII shall not prepare consolidated financial statement in respect of any entity that it controls, nor it shall apply or the equity method of accounting in respect of any entity over which it exercises significant influence. The existence of control or exercise of significant influence by an IAI over another entity may at times require a reassessment of the business model of the IIII and hence applicability of this standard on IIII. So we are saying that we believe that the investment institution has an investment motive, not the business and running the business motive. So from that perspective, uh, from that perspective, it is important that we uh, we uh, uh, we uh, we give an exemption to these institutions. However, from that perspective, if we give that exemption and the auditor or the management feel that they want to consolidate because they have this business control in, in the meaning of having like, you know, supervising, running and controlling a business, then you might need to reassess your own business model. I hope I'm clear on this point because it's a bit confusing point. So generally speaking, investment entities do not consolidate because they have an investment motive, not operational and control motive. However, if they control, they need to reassess their own business model, whether they are subject to this standard or they are subject to FAS1. Now definitions, backend discount is the discount on redemption of investment by an outgoing investor against net asset value of such investment applied in case of triple I being an open end triple I, which is attributable to the equity of or quasi equity as applicable. Backend fee is the fee applicable to the, to the investment manager as charged to an outgoing investor, normally computed on the basis of NAV of such investment in case of an III trip being an open ended triple I. Normally front end backend applies to open ended. Capital transactions include the inflows, for example, through issuance of shares, units of investment, including investments of distributable profits and outflows, for example, through redemption of unit of investment by investors to increase or reduce their respective share in the net assets of a triple F and III and may at times include other directly made adjustments to equity, quasi equity, for example, reduction of share capital against accumulated losses. Front end fee is the fee payable to the investment manager. So, so front end fee and front end premium are at the front end. When somebody comes in, if it, there is a fee that goes to the investor manager, it goes as front end fee. If it is a benefit that is passed on to the current, uh, current uh, participants, in that situation, it is front end premium. Investor ma investment manager is an institution which establishes, manages, operates, and administers an IIII in a fiduciary capacity either in exchange for fee, fixed or variable, under a Vakala Bilistasmar arrangement or against the share of profit at times with incentives under a Mudarva arrangement based on profits or, or profit or profit targets. Explanation and investment manager in certain case situation can be an IIII itself. That is an important point. At the, the asset management company or the investment management company itself can also be a triple I. So it is possible that the company running is a triple I and the fund manager is also a triple I. Investors include the participants in equity or quasi equity of an, on, of an III. We are saying that equity or quasi equity, either way you are investors. The difference is in case of equity, you don't have a put option, means that these are close-ended mutual funds or other type of investment institutions where there is share capital and nobody can just go and say, oh, I want my share capital back. On the other hand, the investment, this, uh, 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 the, the, uh, my, my, my apologies, I'm, I'm just mixing up the two things. Uh, so the quasi-equity ones are the ones where there is an open-ended triple I where the investor always has an option that he can go to the institution and say, oh, I want my money back. So in that situation, it is like this. Islamic investment institutions are such Islamic financial institutions, IFIs, taking the juristic form of corporate entities, trusts, and other financially and legally independent institutions, which are established within 
investment motive that is to invest in a pool of sharia compliant assets and earn returns on investments without an express intention to exercise control over the business underlying such investments and involve investors contributing to the equity or cause the equity of the triple i and at times a combination thereof which represent ownership claims to the underlying assets and entitlements to respective shares in profits or losses explanation triple i's include open ended and closed ended mutual funds voluntary pension schemes real estate investment trust and funds venture capital institutions and funds private equity institutions and funds uh, sovereign wealth funds family office investment institutions and funds etc i think we have a quick comment in the q and a tab from uh, from sister rashda suhail was the equity he has an option to take back his funds and equity funds he cannot right yes exactly so was the equity is different from equity big primarily because of the put option put option means that i am the holder of the instrument and i can always go to the institution and say i want my money back so whatever will be the underlying profit or loss and underlying position of the assets based on that i can encash my money again there will they can be front end and back end fee or uh, front and the, or the premium and low uh, premium uh, load or uh, premium and discount but from that perspective in a nutshell this is the difference so you can have islamic investment institution that have only quasi equity so most of the islamic islamic mutual funds that you will find in different markets they are all having quasi equity not equity okay thank you very much for sister for a very good question and i hope it is clear for you my pleasure now issued value of shares and units is the cumulative value against which shares units of iis are subscribed by the investors against cash or through in reinvestment of receivable profits and in excluding and excluding an ev differential uh, sister howra just make a note of it i think this and might not be needed here excluding an ev differential would be enough we'll we'll have to see this wording again just keep a note of it but probably and might not be needed nav differential in the specific context of those such open ended iais that maintain a nominal value of units as statutory capital is an account being a component of quasi equity used to record element of undistributed comprehensive income loss in, included in the net asset value of units as issued during the period less element of undistributed comprehensive income or loss included in the redemption value of units as redeemed during the period net asset value per share or unit is the amount of net asset value net assets attributable to each share unit at the end of the financial reporting period nav per share share unit shall be calculated by dividing net assets by the number of outstanding shares or units now this is one thing very important earning per share disclosure is required as per fas 1 and but we have not gone in detail and we have kept it to ifrs but ifrs does not specifically require or our other standards do not specifically require the disclosure of nav per share or per unit but considering the nature of investment funds and investment institutions we believe a disclosure of nav per share or per unit is more important than earning per share so from that perspective we have put in the definition and would put in our presentation and disclosure requirement on that part open ended triple i in the specific context of the standard is an iii in which investors contractually and by virtue of regulatory requirements have a right to execute capital transactions particularly the right to redeem their investments all the time on an over the counter basis so i don't need to go into the stock market and sell my shares to others rather i can just go to my inv uh, the investment institution and i say okay redeem my units that's it quasi equity is a definition coming in multiple ofi standards already but since for some people it might be a new concept uh, particularly those related to the investment fund industry who are joining us today let me repeat this one quasi equity in the general context is an element of the financial statement that represents participatory contribution received by an institution on a profit and loss profit sharing or participation basis it has Our primary characteristics of equity, that is, in case of loss, unless negligence, misconduct, breach of contractual terms is proved, the institution is not liable to return the lost funds to the fund providers, and the fund providers share the residual interest in the underlying asset or business. Sister Saira and Hora, just make a note of it. I just want you to compare this definition with the latest one approved on a profit sharing or participation basis. I think I just need to see if the loss taking wording is there in the final version or not. 
just mm -hmm. need to compare it again with the final definition because the definition that was finally approved by the Sharia committee. Certain characteristics of a liability, that is, it has a maturity or a put option of redemption or liquidation, and certain specific features, that is, the right of the fund providers are limited only to the underlying assets of business and not on the whole of the institution, as well as they do not have certain rights associated only with the owner's equity. Explanation. In the specific context, now this explanation is specific to this standard because quasi-equity definition is there in multiple standard, but this one is, is specific here. In the specific context of this standard, quasi-equity includes the units held by investors that have a fixed maturity before liquidation of the IIA it, itself, or put option of redemption, for example, in case of most open-ended IIIs, while on the contrary, the shares or units held by the investors which do not have a fixed maturity before liquidation of the triple I itself or put option of redemption shall be considered equity. I explained this thing, but it is explained here in writing as well. It may generally be presumed that one, an IIA having a fixed liquidation plan or fixed maturity shall have only quasi equity. Two, an open-ended triple I shall have only quasi equity. Three, certain Open-ended IIIs may have more than one class of cause equity, for example, in form of sub-funds. Uh, this is common in case of pension schemes in particular. And four, any other triple I having generally, uh, shall generally have, have equity and may additionally have cause equity. So if you have a fund which is a time-bound fund, fund will be liquidated after five years. It's a cause equity. There is an open-ended triple I in which the holder of the instrument, holder of the units can go back, go to the institution over the counter basis and say, I want to redeem my, my funds and they are required contractually or by law, law to do it. It's an open-ended fund. This is quasi-equity. An open-ended fund, can, uh, like uh, 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 the certain open-ended triple I's may have more than one class of quasi-equity. So there is an open-ended fund like our Islamic pension fund, but it may have multiple schemes running within the pension schemes or multiple funds running within the fund. If they are not segregated and they are not legally uh, incorporated, like, you know, they're given a legal form, separate legal entity form, they all can be considered sub-funds and there can be multiple classes of cause equity. The last situation is that institutions, other than that, are generally have equity because their, their, their shares are not uh, incashable or redeemable over the counter. But some of the investment companies like this, like for example, we can have a part, we can have a private equity company, private equity firm, that private equity firm may have a share capital which is fixed, which means it's equity. But that private equity firm, without creating separate legal entities, may be running multiple private equity firm funds. Same apply to a venture capital fund. There can be a venture capital fund, a venture capital company that is a company, it has a fixed capital, so it has an equity. But it may be running additionally multiple private equity, uh, 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 venture capital funds without giving them legal form. If they give them legal form, they become separate and they will become subject to this standard directly. But if there are multiple funds within that, they will be, they can be considered as quasi equity. And then we have said that sub funds based reporting, columnar reporting or other forms of reporting might be required here. Sharia principles and rules is the specific definition that we have. Uh, I'm not going to repeat that one. Trustee is an entity appointed by the investment manager to serve as an intermediary between the investment manager and the investor to hold the assets for the investment to safeguard the interest of both parties in line with the requirements of the legislation and of constitution documents and to hold the final, uh, I think, uh, uh, Sister Sister Hara, please no, make a note of it. I think here contractual requirements are to be there as well. Legislation, constitution document, documents and contractual requirements. And to hold the final settlement funds in the case of termination or liquidation of the triple I. Now that now we come to the accounting side. We, we were determining the definitions, the scope, and everything. Now coming to accounting side, I want to be like you no know, simplifying the accounting. There is, I'm, I'll try not to read all of it uh, today. Uh, some of the parts are important that I'll read. But in a nutshell, let me explain. We are saying that the business model 
must be selected and that business model will be the basis for selection, adoption and account application of accounting policies. So if your business model is that your investors are interested in the net asset value, then it is more important that all your accounting policies should be closer to fair value. This is an example. So considering the business model of the institution or including the fund, the accounting policies and the approaches towards accounting for underlying assets will be dependent on that. So expectations of the investors, what they expect, investors are more concerned about earnings or they are more concerned about uh, net asset value, et cetera. These are the things that you need to consider. Are they more concerned about distribution of profits and withdrawals or they are more concerned about the encashment of funds or if they are more concerned about transfer of the shares of units. So these are the business models along with the expectations of the investors that actually determine the accounting policies for that you apply. There is a rebuttable presumption that most IAIs, unless proven otherwise, have a business model that requires preparation of the financial statements on a fair value or as close as possible to fair value basis. However, any accounting policies to achieve this objective of fair valuation shall not be selected while compromising on the Sharia principles, the rules or requirements of the UV conceptual framework for financial reporting. For example, if an IIII enters into a Muraba transaction, it shall follow the requirement of respective UV fares instead of applying fair value accounting and hence record receivables and revenues in accordance with the requirements of respective UV fares which prohibit carrying Muraba receivable at fair value. So this is an important understanding. You, there is a rebuttable presumption that funds, investment institutions generally have to follow fair value. But Sharia does not allow a few things to be kept at fair value like receivables and payables cannot be discounted, established receivables and payables. This is just one example that we have given with regard to Muraba. So considering that, you have to keep it close to fair value, but you cannot compromise on Sharia principles and rules or the framework of accounting. In certain circumstances, where an open IIII is required to or as a practice of publishing NAV per unit on a frequent basis earlier than the end of the financial reporting period or respective interim reporting period, such a IIII shall apply the requirements related to interim financial reporting as per respective OFIFAS insofar as practicable. Now, we are talking about the specific policies for specific matters. So we are saying that uh, that all units, uh, 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 that, uh, there is a repeatable presumption that all units of open ended triple I shall always qualify to be accounted for as quasi equity. Accordingly, an open ended triple I shall develop appropriate accounting policies for issuance and redemption of the unit, including the front end fee, front end premium, front end NAV differential, back end fee, back end discount. The accounting policy for net NAV differential where applicable shall be developed reflecting its nature in line with the contractual arrangements and the requirements of this standard. In most cases, NAV differential is not recognized as income of the IAI being considered as part of the capital transactions and shall rather constitute a part of the quasi equity along with the issued value of new debts. Trade date versus settlement date accounting. Accounting policy in respect to selection of trade date versus settlement date accounting shall be developed consistently applied and adequately disclosed in line with Sharia principles and rules. Recognition of fee and share attributable to investment manager. Now, there are some complicated issues related to the fee that or the share that you pass on to the investment manager. Accounting policies in respect of accounting for fee share of profit attributable to the investment manager shall be developed consistently applied and adequately disclosed in line with Sharia principles and rules in the following manner. In case of investment manager, according to Vakala Vilas Tasmar or any other form of Vakala or service error based arrangement, the accounting policy for recognition of fee payable to investment manager shall be determined in line with FAST 31, including the contingent, variable, and all other type of fee, but FAST 31 shall apply. In case of investment manager being a Mudarba based arrangement, the accounting policy for recognition of share of profit payable to the investor manager shall be determined in line with respective UFI FAS. That is our PAS on part petty venture for which we have issued the exposure draft. Probably that standard will be finalized before this standard or maybe on the same date. Both of them may have the uh, same effective date. Now coming to the next part, which is very, so initially this we were talking about selection and application of accounting policies and accounting approaches. Now we come to the minimum contents of the financial statements and presentation of financial statements. Okay, still we don't have any question. Uh, probably people are getting bored today. I don't know. Or they're sleeping. Honestly, no idea. Because for most uh, regions that we are addressing, it is still a daytime. So I hope they are not sleeping. 
or the third thing that I say at times is that I'm too good. There are no questions because I'm too good explaining so well. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I'm just kidding. Okay, a uh, complete set of financial statements for the purpose of presentation of financial statements of the IAIs, the requirements of phase one shall apply, except for the specific requirements of paragraph 18. Now, paragraph 18 is saying the complete set of financial statement of IIII shall include a statement of financial position or a statement of net assets. This is the balance sheet. A statement of financial activities or a statement of income and other comprehensive income for the financial reporting period as a single statement unless otherwise required by the regulation of the respective jurisdiction. So we are suggesting that a statement of income and comprehensive income should be called as one single statement of financial activities or a statement of income and other comprehensive income. But we are, we are saying that because of the nature of Islamic Western institutions, a lot of statements should not be there. Mainly one statement would be enough. And considering the concept of fair value accounting to the maximum extent, it is better to have one only statement. Let me put a question. We don't need to put a poll on that, but we just put a question on which we can invite your comments that there was a discussion with regard to having a statement of changes in net assets as well. The difference between the statement of financial activities and the statement of change in net assets would be that the statement of change in net assets would be having the capital transactions as well. That was a discussion point. We would request the participants, particularly those from the relevant industry and the regulators, if they feel that there is an advantage of allowing the statement of changes in net assets here. In that situation, what we are taking to a statement of changes in causal equity and a statement of changes in uh, uh, equity might also be covered in one single statement as a statement of change in net assets. We, however, after initial discussions at the working group at the board level, considered that it's better to keep uh, not, better not to keep that statement of change in net assets and rather to keep uh, these statements separate, like the statement of change in equity and the statement of owner's equity. So the statement of cash flows is mandatory. Probably it was not required by the earlier standard, if I'm not mistaken. A statement of changes in owner's equity, where the III has owner's equity. So if you are a mutual fund which is open-ended and you don't have owner's equity, you are not required to have a statement of changes in owner's equity. The second is the statement of changes in quasi equity, where you have quasi equity or where you have quasi equity plus owner's equity both. So uh, an Islamic mutual fund which is open ended will normally have E. Islamic mutual fund which is close ended will normally have D. And Islamic investment institution which also has funds and sub funds might have D and E both. Like an Islamic venture capital company which has owner's equity, so they need ED, and they might have some funds, which are which are not uh, segregated funds, and not, uh, 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 not, uh, uh, not like, you know, legally legal entity funds. So that can be part of cause equity. So from that perspective, it is possible that some institutions may have both D and E, but normally closed-ended mutual funds will be having D, open-ended mutual funds will be having E, and investment institutions having multiple funds may have D and E together. Then there will be notes comprising for significant accounting policies, et cetera, as well. Okay, can we have the answer to the poll that we uh, ra uh, raised earlier, sisters? How many people have responded before concluding the poll? How many people have responded? 46. 46. Okay, not uh, not the majority has not responded, but out of the people that responded, we can see that uh, the majority is in favor of keeping two different standards. Thank you very much. We, it is helpful. Again, we, we will take this comment to the working group and to the board because they will see how much effort and uh, benefit, cost versus benefit and having two different standards. But thank you very much for your input. It is helpful. Now, minimum contents uh, disclosure and all these requirements as per phase one will be there except for uh, in addition to the requirements of paragraphs 20 to 35. So in paragraphs 20 to 35, we are putting the requirements which are related to each of the statement and the notes. So statement of financial position, we are asking that NAV per share or unit should be disclosed, particularly for the open-ended financial triple uh, I. And disclosure should be made of bifurcation between undistributed accumulated comprehensive profit loss being realized or unrealized and distributable and distributable. This is very important that some gains or losses if they are realized and unrealized and distributable or not distributable. I think there is a question in the Q&A tab. 
from Sister Rashta Suhail. NAM disclosure not for close ended, not mandatory for close ended. Thank you very much. It's a very good comment. I think uh, Sister Hora, Sister Sarah, make a note of it. We should say that for open ended, this NAV, dis NAV per share or unit is mandatory. For close ended, it should be preferred based on comments from Sister Rajda Swell. I think it should still be preferred. But uh, Sister, please try to understand why it is not mandatory on close ended. Because if I have a close ended fund, I cannot go to the institution and get it in cash based on NAV. So it is quite possible that its NAV may be different from the market value on which I can actually sell it to another person. The market value at times is dependent on the sentiments and dependent on the on the on the market demand and supply, the money supply, the interest rates in the market that impact actually the market pricing. So, for example, if the benchmark rate is ten percent and my earning per share of the closed ended fund is five percent, so maybe the price of the fund might be half, although NAV might not be half. NAV might be equal. So, it is quite possible that NAV in a closed ended fund will not be will not be giving you the right picture about what amount you can get it in the market. But yes, I agree that it uh, it, it would be it, it would be uh, preferable. But again, it may be misleading as well. I'm I'm okay. It's better to disclose, and I'm okay that we should put it. It should be disclosed, uh, uh, like you know, if possible, in the mutual close ended for IAI also. But for me. The close-ended IAI, since you don't have a redemption option at the hand of the on the over the counter, the price that you will actually get might be misleading. Thank you very much for a very good comment. We will consider that as I suggested that we may put as a preferred or optional disclosure. So we can put it as preferred or optional, but not mandatory for sure. Earning per share shall be made, earning per share disclosure shall be made by all IAIs excluding open and IAIs in line with the requirement of relevant AOP fairs and generally accepted accounting principles. Disclosure shall be made of bifurcation between net comprehensive profit or loss for the period being realized or realized and being distributable or undistributable. This is on the statement of financial activities. These are the disclosures on the statement of financial activities. A statement of changes in quasi-equity. Now, this is an important statement which is unique to this standard because there is a statement of quasi-equity in the, in the uh, banking sector. That is different. That banking sector statement of changes in equity, quasi-equity, uh, uh, it is not a statement of changes in quasi-equity. That is called a statement of uh, 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 attribution and distribution of attribution of profits and all that according to the cause equity. The name of the statement is also slightly different. My apologies for not remembering the name exactly right now. But the banking statement, uh, banking sector statement of cause equity is not a is a disclosure statement only. This one is not a disclosure statement because and uh, and uh, there will be entries routed through this one. So this is a statement of cause equity changes in cause equity similar to the statement of changes in equity in an entity. Now, what you need to disclose here, value of units and undistributed income and accumulated losses at the beginning of the period, proceeds from issuance of units, including number of units issued, front-end premium, for, uh, for NAV differential, uh, payments on redemption of units during the period, including the number of units redeemed, back-end discount and NAV differential, and then net comprehensive income or loss for the financial reporting period, distributions to investors during the period, value of units and distributed income as of the end of the, and distributed income or accumulated loss at the end of the period. So this is a full disclosure statement similar to the, to the, to the statement of change in equity. But this is the capital, uh, in, in other words, is the capital transaction movement. So the capital transaction movement similar to statement of change in equity will be appearing here. So this statement of chain equity should not be mixed up with the uh, quasi-equity statement on the banking side. In case of more than one class of quasi-equity, in case of having multiple sub-funds, the statement of chain equity shall provide the necessary information through columnar presentation or through notes in respect of each material class of quasi-equity. A, a triple I shall in, disclose the following transactions for the uh, for the period in notes to the financial statement. The front end fee paid by the investors to the investor manager directly at the time of investment and the back end fee charged to the investors and paid to the paid to the investment manager, charged to investors and paid to the investment manager and the balance thereon. Okay, just one thing. 
sister Haura and sister uh, Saira, please make a note of it. Here we are asking for the balance and in A we are not asking for the balance. Maybe we might need to check uh, and make it aligned. Maybe the balance related disclosure might not be necessary. So maybe we just need to align A and B. One is on the front end, one is on the back end, but A and B need to be aligned. On the investment side, insofar as practicable, disclosure of complete movement of investments in individual investment instruments shall be made, including the amounts and number of shares, units of investment purchased and sold during the period. Considering the business model of the III, the additional disclosure shall be made in respect of investments, for example, disclosing portfolio subcategories in addition to the disclosure requirements for such investments in line with relevant DOFI phases. Disclosure should also be made of the value of investment if it is not available in, with the investment custodian and reason thereof segregating between any, uh, okay, just one, uh, one question, uh, uh, just one point, uh, brother, uh, brother Faisal and uh, sister, uh, sister Hora and of Saira, just make a note of, it, a note of it, investment custodian, we did not define anywhere else. So maybe we need to consider the term here. Uh, we defined trustee, but we did not define the investment custodian. So we need to maybe clarify something. Maybe even if we don't need to put a note, we might need to clarify something here. So uh, the, the investment used as a pledge during the trade and settlement of any exposure during the period during the extra, through the extra exchange, and if any investment is recognized in the books of the account by custody is not yet received. Uh, sub funds in case of an IIA, having sub fund disclosure shall be made with regard to each material sub fund as if it is of an operating segment of an IIA in line with the relevant OP phases. Investment manager and trustee as related parties. IAI shall disclose necessary information in respect of the transaction balances and non monetary interests, along with brief description about the contextual relationship with the investment manager as well as trustee, considering the them significant related parties in line with the relevant of standards. So all transactions with trustee and all transactions with investment manager must be disclosed as related party transactions. Risk-related disclosures are required according to the respective OFI standards. Phase, four, phase one requires it. Just one thing to clarify, AOFI is in the process of developing uh, illustrative financial statements for this one as well. The last phase 14 had very small uh, set of uh, illustrative financial statements. We will be bring. We need to bring it a full set of illustrative financial statements, a very appropriate set, inshallah, in due course. Uh, just one thing, Sister Hora and Brother Faisal, I think we should mention it in the significant changes as well that the illustrative uh, illustrative financial statement, which were earlier part of the appendix, are no more included. Risk-related disclosure should include uh, the proportion of investments and the risk mitigation techniques and uh, uh, sub, uh, in case of sub-funds for limited period, uh, how, how there will be redemption scheme and the managing liquidity will be there, particularly liquidity risk management is a big risk. And the rating of investment manager, ring, ranking of the III and where applicable uh, uh, the respective sub-funds. Uh, again, the question, uh, bro uh, Brother Faisal and Sister Hora, please make a note of it about ranking. Uh, ranking versus rating because ranking we haven't defined anywhere. So what we mean by ranking here or shall we use that same term as rating or we may need to re uh, uh, explain it properly. So these are the additional disclosures. With that, we have a effective date proposed as 2027. We intend to finalize this standard within this year. Probably this was the first public hearing. We'll try to complete the public hearings by third quarter and we'll try to completed by the end of the year, inshallah. So here I will stop and will open uh, open floor for discussion. So anybody who want to speak up, okay, we have a hand raised by Mojave Smile. It was raised earlier as well. So we can be allowed, I think, you earlier to speak. So if you want to speak up, uh, anybody else uh, want to put their questions in the Q&A tab right now, or if they want to, uh, if they want to like uh, speak up, please let us know. Okay, uh, Mif Mi Brother Miftahu Dibaba also uh, has raised hand. That they uh, please go ahead, please. You want to speak up? Please go ahead. Okay, there are two hands raised. We have allowed both of you to speak up, but uh, probably there might be some problem at your end. So not sure about it. You can still put the points in the Q&A tab. 
So uh, let's uh, try to conclude. Before concluding, one last uh, opportunity to request all of you to, if you have any comment with regard to this standard or the earlier standard that we discussed on Professor Gibson Prizes, please feel free to provide your comments in writing uh, at uh, accounting at aof.com. Uh, you can, you can uh, still, before we close, you can, if you have any comment, please feel free to put that comment right now. Otherwise, I'll request the colleagues to kindly conclude the session for today. Uh, today, I would like to thank all of you for being here with us. And we understand that we have been keeping all of you very busy. And last uh, couple of weeks, there have been so many public hearings and other events, roundtables. So probably we are pushing too much hard on you. So from that perspective, uh, we can well understand that the number of participants uh, has slightly reduced today and even the activity level was a bit less. Sister Noof has provided the email address in the chat window. And uh, with, with nobody else speaking up, I would like to like request our team. I would like to thank you all for being with us. And I would like to request the team to kindly conclude it. Sister Hora, please go ahead. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Brother Omar, for the insightful presentation and the Q&A session. We would like to thank UAE Banks Federation, all the participants, and all our colleagues here in AUFI. Inshallah, we see you again in the future in other public hearings on other standards in both English and Arabic. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.